Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, last month, the West looked on nervously as Russia held its biggest joint military drill with China since 1981. Now, NATO is getting ready to flex its military muscles back. British troops disembarked in Rotterdam today, ahead of NATO's biggest military exercises on the northern flank since the Cold War. The soldiers are en route to Norway for the Trident Juncture exercise, which launches on the 25th of October. And the war games involve 45,000 soldiers, more than 60 large large ships, 120 aircraft and 10,000 vehicles. Well, with me in the studio to talk European defense, Russian threats and war games, we have your news journalist for the Russian service, Andrei Bekatov. Thank you for joining us. Rasmussen Global's chief strategy officer, Fabrice Potier, and Austrian MEP with the Green Party, Klaus Buchner. All right, I will put this question to you uh, first, uh, Fabrice. You know, is this, uh, is this NATO exercise right now is it antagonizing Russia? Is it preparation or is it saber rattling? No, I think it's neither of those. It's just training and exercise, really, long just... plan in advance. No, absolutely. And it's defensive in their nature. They are fully transparent. The Russian observer and all the other OSCE observers have been invited to the exercise. The, the main thrust of the exercise has been announced ahead. So there's no surprise and there's no opacity. And NATO needs to exercise as a and defensive alliance. And the timing alliance. of it right after China and Russia had I just think done the military timing exercises? Was planned, it's, yeah, okay. but I think the timing was planned already years ago. These exercises are, are cyclic. Uh, and it's not the same scale. We are talking here about 40,000 troops. Uh, the Russian exercise allegedly was 300,000 troops. So it's not the same scale. All right, uh, Andre, what do you think? Is this antagonizing Russia, this, these kinds of uh, military exercises? Well, it's definitely a response. And uh, it was planned before, of course, but uh, they can't plan the increased tension. And Russia, of course, uh, they started first this big series of maneuvers. Although the number of troops were grossly exaggerated, independent experts says, in fact, there were only about 300,000. It's a third of the whole Russian uh, army. In fact, there were about 330,000. But what they did achieve is the movement of troops that was really impressive to round up so many soldiers from all around the, the uh, vast country put them in a position that was huge achievement, which NATO now has to match because mm -hmm. for them, uh, mobility is a is challenge as well. All right. I just want to bring in a statement from Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO. He uh, gave this statement to our politics today. He said, as with all NATO exercises, Trident Juncture is not directed against any country or region. It is about ensuring our forces can work seamlessly together in a crisis. And he did also say that, I mean, that, that the uh, Trident Juncture has been planned for around five years, as you were saying. So this is information from NATO. All right. Do we really believe, I'll put this to you, do, really, do we really believe this is not directed at any country? I mean... Well, look only at the place where it takes place. Uh, it's quite close to the Russian border. So it's clear what it is meant for. And it's clearly a response, as you have said, a response to the Russian uh, exercises. And I agree, uh, we need exercises. We are composed uh, of many different nations. They need to exercise together. But is it really necessary to do it so closely to the border? I think it would have been much better to do it in a different place. Is it necessary to do it so close to Russia? You, you, you were painting it as something neutral. It was planned. It's, not, it's not, nothing to read into it. But it is close to the Russian border. It is. And it's also in the northern Atlantic where Russia has some very regular movements of, of forces, especially the naval ones. But I think we need to distinguish something. This is not a, an exercise that is against Russia, where Russia is taken explicitly as a target or as the adversary. But obviously, like any exercise, this is a signal. This is a message sent to Russia and to, to any other potential adversary saying, we will do what it takes to defend our territory. And Norway is part of the NATO territory. And the Northern Atlantic is considered as a strategic area for the security of the alliance between mm -hmm. North America and Europe. So I think it's, it's about sending a message that is an important message, but it's not an escalatory one. It's more defensive one saying we can defend our territory. Oh, that's, we, we don't know how Russia would probably view that. But let's, uh, I want to, to bring something else, because last week Euronews has spoke to German Defense Minister Ursula von der Leyen, where while she sees NATO as essential, she's calling for a reinforced European defense union that she hopes will become, quote, worthy of that name. 
Denn ich sehe viele Gebiete, wo die NATO nicht gefragt wird. Keine Sicherheitsstrukturen aufgebaut einer europäischen Verteidigungsunion, die diesen Namen auch verdienen. Das haben wir in den letzten anderthalb Jahren, da haben wir einen Riesensprung nach vorne gemacht. Wir haben die Strukturen, die lange im Lissabon-Vertrag geschlummert haben, jetzt aus der Taufe gehoben. Das heißt, wir haben einen Rechtsrahmen für die Europäische Verteidigungsunion. Wir haben einen gemeinsamen Planungsprozess, damit wir eine strategische Kultur auch entwickeln als Europäer. Wann setzen wir denn unsere Kräfte? All right, a European Defense Union, um, Klaus. Is this really necessary for Europe to do? And isn't it dangerous? I mean, are we talking, are we actually thinking of actual war? Traditional war? Well, uh, of course, uh, you know the old Roman saying, si vis pacem parabellum, if you want peace, prepare for the war. And in this respect, I think we need a common defense. That's for me clear. But a common defense does not mean escalating. So uh, we should be very careful what we do. Uh, we should exercise together, that's necessary, but we should do it in a way that it's no provocation to Russia. We should do it in a... How is that possible? How do you do military exercise that's not a provocation? How does that work? Well, uh, let's put it in the other way. What Russia does is a provocation, very clearly. And uh, so you should avoid this effect. You should have just a regular exercise, uh, which you usually do in military terms uh, every half year or every year. Uh, that's common. Uh, you should perhaps not do it in this size and especially not on this place. That's my statement. Would, would NATO, would, would, it be, would, it, would a European Defence Union be competing with the relevance of NATO if, if the European Union were to come up with that? I don't think so, uh, especially because in the end, the heavy lifting, as we call it in military terms, so deterrence, including nuclear deterrent, is still going to be done by NATO for the foreseeable future. I think it's very welcome to have the European Defence Union. Europe should be able to do more and can do more. But I think we're still a long way from a Europe that can do the very heavy lifting that only NATO so far is capable of doing. So I don't think there is any threat as such. The question is, where do we put our political focus? Is it more at NATO or more in the EU? And where do we also put our money? Meaning, you know, are we investing more in capabilities to do crises outside Europe? Or are we pu putting more money in capabilities to do crises inside Europe? And I think, mm -hmm. or at the border. And this is really the, the key question.